Yo, yo, and hello, friends. My name is Joe Idoni. This is the Preferred Lines Podcast. I'm thrilled. I'm excited. I'm fired up. It's the biggest week of the year in covering golf content. It's Masters Week, baby. The pianos are in tune. The azaleas are in full bloom. Uh, let's talk a little Masters. Come on, Iron Form. They're going to go nuts when he hits this thing. (laughs) Yesterday's price is not today's price. Welcome back. Incredible. Awesome show lined up for you tonight to cover the Masters. I have brought my good friend Will Gray here alongside to give me some some expert analysis and tell me all the areas in which my picks are wrong because it's been that kind of year. We're going to recap a little bit of an electric Sunday out in San Antonio before we shift all focus to Augusta, Georgia and Augusta National Golf Club. Um, What is up, Joe? What is up, Ted? It is great to see you guys. If anyone is else here, um, please, if you're viewing this on Twitter, do me a quick favor. This is a the biggest week of the year for people who pour their heart and soul into golf content, whether it be fantasy, whether it be gambling, whether it be covering these individual tournaments. Support those people. If you are here watching this show now, be kind, share it with a friend, a like, a retweet, a subscribe on YouTube goes a heck of a long way, and we greatly appreciate it. I have to mention that this show is proudly presented, as you see the icon logo up there in your top right-hand corner, by the good people over at Roto Baller. The promo this week is outrageous. The biggest discount that they have done all year. The code, don't use my code, use the code MASTERS, all one word, all caps. It's going to get you 30% off a PGA Premium sub. Um, that's going to get you down if you do an annual to like six dollars and some change per week it is the best deal in fantasy content there's going to be like 20 to 25 articles published this week five or six by myself other great contributors model maniac spencer you get access to all their tools joe nicely flag hunting pod all the live stuff that we do as well Um, it is the best value deal in golf content make sure to use that promo code masters 30 percent off now let's do this thing um i'm just going to get right into the guest segment I'm so pumped to get this guy on the show this week. I met him in person a few weeks ago at the Players' Championship. He is the man in charge of overseeing golf bet and the entrance from the PGA Tour into the golf fantasy betting space. Uh, I'm talking about the one and only Will Gray. It's a pleasure to have you on the show this week, Will. How are you? Happy Masters Week. Happy Masters Week, Joe. Great to be here. Enjoy a chance to connect with you and, and talk a little shop as always. Uh, it's, it's Monday night of Masters Week. I'm already a little exhausted, which is a great sign for a big week ahead. As you said, this is, uh, you know, the North Star for people in our in our world of, you know, golf fans and handicappers and DFS enthusiasts. This is this is an unparalleled week, uh, whether you're on the ground or just trying to figure out who's going to leave with a green jacket. Absolutely, man. What are your plans for this week? Because I know oftentimes you're at events. I know that you've got some responsibilities at home with young kids that we both spent some time putting to bed before the show went live tonight. Um, What's your Thursday to Sunday going to look like this week? Yeah, uh, if you have extra tickets, let me know. I'm happy to take them off your hands. Uh, We're going to be grinding hard at uh, you know PGA Tour headquarters here in in Ponte Vedra Beach and um, looking at, as you said, it's, it's such for us. A, a fire hose of content from Monday to Wednesday, and then things kind of change Thursday to Sunday. But it's still even this week, you know, it's such a focus for us at, at Golf Bet and at the tour and uh, in, in our world of looking at micro markets, looking at in play, looking at live betting. And we're always trying to expand opportunities to point people there, to draw, you know, new content offerings and, and just shine a light on listen, if you didn't bet on this guy, on Wednesday, when you're eating your lunch, there's still an opportunity to get in. They're looking like there's weather that could impact things on Thursday. How does that impact things if, if the first round spills into Friday? Uh, so it, it's not, you know, maybe five or six years ago, golf betting content was, you know, you had four or five outrights. You picked on Monday and Tuesday, and then you tuned in on Sunday to see if you had a sweat or not. This is a seven-day-a-week grind. I'm preaching to the choir. I know telling you that, but that's kind of kind of our mindset. It, it shifts a little bit from Wednesday into Thursday once the ball goes in the air, but the work certainly doesn't stop. 
Yeah, it, it's like Super Bowl week for us. The amount of prop offerings and additional sort of, you know, nationality bets and debutante bets. It's so fun to sort of sift through those. And I did a lot of that this morning in Top Amateur. Uh, we'll get into some of that stuff. But I wanted to touch on, you know, you and I had spoke and we were at the Players' Championship, which at the time I'm, I'm like, this is incredible. Tournament of the year. All the names are up here. Scotty chases them all down and wins. But the interesting thing, Will, is like you get moments like yesterday and all, albeit it's not doesn't have the same star power. The impact of watching that on television, how compelling that was to see someone like Denny McCarthy, sort of a journeyman who's like climbed up through the ranks and through um, Q school and going through all these things and on this ascension, searching long for his first PJ Tour victory all of a sudden come and hunt down Akshay Batia. And Akshay played amazing himself. I think he shot the fourth best round of the day and started with a four-stroke lead and had to end up doing it in a playoff. How impressed were you with what happened yesterday from both Batia and McCarthy? And how much does that speak to, um, I guess, the nature and the depth that the PGA Tour can create compelling, interesting television week to week for viewers? Yeah, the only downside was that it was uh, two hours of electric performance that basically ended with a, a chunked wedge shot, which I'm very familiar with, into the water. I know. Uh, <laughs> so, it, listen, it happens. But, uh, no, you're right. I, I think I was listening to Sirius XM today on the drive back from the office, and John McGinnis uh, had, a, had a good point of it would have been a much more impactful loss for Akshay if he had lost. Because you look at it, you're, you're a young guy coming up. And yes, he's already won on tour, but this is an event of a different magnitude. And to go out there with a four shot lead, you've been leading the whole time and then you play really well, right? You're, you're in among the top five rounds of the day and then you potentially still get caught by this guy that goes on an absolute heater. That's one that can kind of live in your kitchen uh, for a few weeks and months. And maybe that changes his trajectory uh, as a tour pro at an early stage. And But instead he does end up getting the win. Listen, I think we both think that Denny McCarthy is gonna get a win at some point, just like Cameron Young is gonna get into the winner's circle. But you're right, it speaks to the depth and. And the notion, as we've seen all through the first three or four months of the season, that anyone teeing it up, whether you're 10 to 1 or 100 to 1, has a, a live chance to to win. Maybe this week at the Masters, the, the list is a little bit thinner. You're not quite going to make a case for all 89 players, but the depth is absolutely there week in and week out, and we saw it in spades on Sunday. Yeah, gutted for my guy, Denny. Um, I think Rick Gaiman had the tweet that uh, his, from a strokes gain perspective, his performance this past week at, at the Valero Texas Open would have been good enough to win like the last 160 PGA Tour events. He gained yeah. 21 strokes on the field. Um, one shy and impressive, I thought, from Akshay to make that putt on the 18th hole. Um, genuinely, I don't know many players who are coming back like, what that took, and I think he he credited a lot to the mental coach who he's working with, who I saw a piece, the same one that coached up Steven Yeager and the same one that coached up Wyndham Clark on these aspects. And the mental fortitude to like have that guy go on that kind of run in your group while you're trying to get into the Masters, go one up on the 18th hole and then come back and make that 12-foot putt, I think speaks a lot to the the work he's put in, the preparation he's put in. You know, he, unlike Denny, um, didn't go to college, went straight pro, but also had struggles, right? He had significant points and low points of his career where he had to be thinking to himself, am I good enough to do this? So to see him power through that to see him you know persevere and and come out a winner on top uh was very happy for him to get in the field this week it'll be exciting to see him you know tee it up at augusta national i know denny was already in the field but like like you said i think it's coming for mccarthy for sure and i, I will say hand up i i got it wrong on Akshay. i i've already said this before this is not uh a new but i i was at the valspar covering that event when he made his pro debut and asked for the definition of the word adversity. Someone asked for him, he's like, I don't know what that word means. And I'm looking around at, at my colleagues being like, what is this kid doing here? He is so misguided. This, this cannot possibly pan out. He's going straight to the Corn Ferry Tour. He doesn't have stats. He's trying to Monday queue in a Corn Ferry event. It's like, what is going on? And I was absolutely wrong. It, it totally has worked out for him. He's now twice a winner on the PGA Tour, firmly cemented uh, as, as a player that can tee it up any week. And, uh, and really succeed. So listen, sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. But I think going back to McCarthy, we've all been in that position when you're playing a match against someone and he's just scooping it from everywhere. And you get like four or five holes in and you just start expecting him 
to make the next putt or the next four putts or whatever. The guy's just not going to miss. And that was kind of the, the freight train that Achi was running into on Sunday. It helped that he had as big a lead as he did. I think if that tournament goes 74 or 75 holes in regulation, maybe it's a different outcome. Uh, but again, going back to the, the live and in-play stuff that's such a focus for us, over the putt on 18, after McCarthy had made his, Achi was like plus 300 or plus 350, depending on where you shop. So that that shows, you know, the Hosmakers are saying maybe he's got a 25, 30% chance to make this putt. Uh, from 10 or 12 feet there, and he puts it in and then does what he needs to do in the playoffs. So uh, great performance from both of them, but but super, uh, you know, deserve it for Akka to get get win number two. Yeah, the, I guess the other storyline from the week, and I wanted to ask you about it because if anyone who's sort of in this betting and fantasy golf space, you're also very much clued in, I think, with the tour being a direct partner with them. Um Everyone and I went to the course and played Sunday morning and all anyone wanted to talk about was the situation with Jordan Spieth uh, hitting out of a hazard into a clubhouse. I'm they're all asking me because they know I do this stuff and they're like, how is that allowed? How is a clubhouse in bounds? And there are some things about professional golf, I think, Will, that are so simplistic and beautiful in that there's no charging. There's no pass interference. It's all about how many strokes you have to get it in the hole. There's really no officiating. But then there's some parts that are so overcomplicated and don't make any common sense. Do you think it deters some casual fans in any way? Do you think the tour sees it as a problem that they may need to clean up and, um, deploy things like internal out of bounds and, and, and add some common sense to some of these situations, or is it so regimented by the rule book and section 4.3 a B, you know, whatever it is that they have to stick to these rules that are, are, are archaic. It seems in some aspects. I don't know that Jordan speed hitting it onto a roof was really on the list of things <laughs> to worry about entering last week for, for anyone uh, of my colleagues at the tour. So it, it comes up every now and then. I remember back, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember this crap of uh, when Tiger did it at the Bridgestone, uh, at Firestone, he, he bounced one off the car path and it went over the roof there and kind of into the kitchen. So uh, this is not the first time it's happened, but you're right. Sometimes, you know, our colleague Kyle Porter wrote a whole book about normal sport, uh, yeah. about just the things that, that are oddities in golf that it's hard to explain to someone that's not, in the mix, I will say on the internal OB thing, it goes the other way too, where sometimes we have tournaments to put in internal OB and there's backlash there too, where it's like, well, why can't I, you know, play the 15th hole down the 12th fairway and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So it's, it's uh, kind of a catch 22 at certain times. There are always, when you're in an outdoor sport like that, there are going to be some situations that you just don't encounter. You don't think of, I, I can't imagine anyone looked at that clubhouse uh, and thought, oh, we need to worry about. about we need to white to stake it. this thing, yeah, right? Well, in. Yeah, let's let's get some spray paint out and figure this out. So uh, sometimes Jordan Spieth does Jordan Spieth things, and that was the case this past week. Okay, let's sort of shift a little bit to Augusta National this week. Um, I think, Will, that part of the beauty of Augusta National in a course that still holds its legacy and tradition that was built in 1933 is it continues to evolve and adapt to sort of fit the modern player without losing its luster, without losing its its heart and its soul. Um, another addition this year, they moved the 2T back a little bit. I did not think, and you know, I don't have the scoring average in front of me, but I remember last year um, the scoring was not that much different, even though they moved that tee box back substantially. Players were still able to get after that hole. Um, the big changes at 11 a few years ago. Do you think this one makes any difference at two in terms of um, the angle of it? Because it does feel like from what I – here's the thing. What I remember is it used to be like that type of hole and 13, for instance, you used to have to play a draw, right, or be a lefty and sort of slice it around there. Now players hit it so high, whether it's Rom or whether it's Brooks or whether it's DJ. And it's these guys that are just taking it directly over the trees and they're hitting a cut on a draw hole. And it doesn't matter because they're hitting it 180 feet in the air. Um, do you think this could potentially deter some of that and bring back some of the essence of shot shaping that is required at a course like Augusta National? I think it's an important 10 yards. I, they know what they're doing, as with all things Augusta National. But this is something where you're right. This was a hole that was designed to hit that kind of rope hook, not quite as, as hard of a hook as you need on 13, but you have to turn the ball right to left, uh, whether you're coming as a, a slice to the left or a draw with the righty. But guys were starting to be able to 
hit it uh, with a little bit of a cut and access that shoot. If you, this is like I'm visualizing the hole in my head. I'm thinking, well, this is kind of inside baseball. You have to know what the hole looks like. And I'm sure that that's 85 percent of whoever's watching this. We're, we're deep in the weeds here. So we can yeah, go yeah. here. Uh, you, you're trying to fly the bunker and catch that shoot and get that extra 50, 60 yards of roll. And to be able to do that with a, a fade or a cut for a right-handed player was never how it was intended. And now I think that bunker is very much in play. We're gonna, I, you know, I haven't checked the stats to see how many balls ended up there in the last two, three, four years. But I think there's definitely going to be an uptick of guys hitting that uh, center line trap, essentially, as you're looking at it from the tee, trying to get around that corner. And now the, the angle, as you said, has changed a little bit to where if you do want to play that cut, you've got to get a little bit closer to those trees. And, yeah. and you don't want to catch one of those limbs. Now you're costing yourself. 100 or 120 yards uh, if you don't catch it just right so it's yeah. a, it's a small change it's it's some, one that i'm sure that players that have played there 10 or 12 times are going to notice and it's maybe not one that jumps off the page for a casual viewer but i do think it's going to impact things slightly listen it's still one of the easier holes on right. at Augusta national it's still a birdie hole it's one that you're thinking about uh, making a good score on but it is going to change at least a little bit uh, the angle of attack and how you how you approach it off the tee. And I do think it's going to bring six or seven a little bit closer into play if you stray, especially with that tee shot. Yeah, and you catch one of those limbs. I mean, that's that's lost ball over there. That's re-tee yeah. for many of these guys in situations, which is not worth, I think, the the risk associated when you can still make four. You know, you take a three-wood off the tee, you stay short of that bunker, you can still make four. Um, but it'll be interesting to see, like you said, they're so calculated and they understand the nuances of, of every single thing that they do there. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on the the comments today from Xander Shoffley that I heard of the course playing extremely firm and fast. I had talked to some people who um, are close to a couple of players who went on a scouting trip about a month ago and they told me the same thing. They're like, it is as firm as they have ever seen it a month before the Masters. Now we're getting weather that's coming in and looks like it's could potentially impact the first round. At least it's going to rain about an inch the day before and soften that stuff up. Um, do you expect them to be able to dry the course out? Is it their goal, do you think, in this the intention this year to make the course play firmer, faster, which is, is the only thing that I've found that really makes golf courses harder? Like Distance doesn't always equal hard for these professional players. Super firm greens equals hard and i think that that might be the goal that's in play or do they just have it playing that way now on the monday before because they know the rain's coming wednesday thursday i don't think that they're going to the usga extreme of like let's just bake this thing out and and see what happens i do think that the last couple of years and you throw in 2020 when it was played in november and it was pretty soft then there's yeah. been significant weather the last couple of years where it has played a little softer than they probably would like so I think if you ask them, uh, you know, would you rather skew towards play or toward the course being too soft or too firm, they'd rather have it be a little too firm. It's probably something they are trying to get ahead of it, knowing there's going to be some rain Wednesday into Thursday. It doesn't seem like the forecast is going to show as much rain as we had the last couple of years when you kind of had, uh, you know, a washout day last year of the opening round. So uh, I, I think that by the time we get to Sunday, it's going to be, again, skewing a little towards firm. I mean, let's make no mistake. No, no one controls the golf course more than Augusta National. The machines they have under around the, that golf course is unbelievable of the degree of control that they have over the course conditions. So it, by the time we get to the weekend, it's going to be playing very close to where they want it to be. But yeah, I do think that it's probably going to skew a little towards the firm side. And I love it. I, I think it makes for more, more entertaining viewing. I think it, it rewards good shots. It penalizes bad shots. Uh, the margins for error around Augusta National are already razor thin. I think if it's firm, it, it makes that even more so. And it's just exciting to watch, you know, when you're coming in from 200 yards and it's going to make a, a material difference of 10 or 15 feet of do you hit it here or do you hit it there? And that might be the difference between a birdie and a bogey. I love it. Yeah, absolutely phenomenal. You know, the major weeks feel like they've sort of elevated in a sense because we get to live guys back in the field this week. Um do you think that we're close to a deal? And let's let's just say, Will, if a deal were to be announced within a month that these two tours have plans to come back together, when's like when is a realistic time frame for when that actually is implemented? Or do you think we're we could be six months away after a deal, or are we like years down the road before we see these guys, Rom and Brooks and DJ, able to compete in PGA Tour tournaments potentially again? Jay Monahan and Yasser have not yet invited me to the meetings where they discuss a timeline. So I don't, I don't have exact specifics to share there. 
Uh, listen, I, I think everyone can agree we're, we're a couple years into this this new order of, of golf. And I think we are all have come to the realization that it is a better product for the fans when everyone is under the same tent. And you have a week like this where you've got the best players in the world all duking it out for a, a coveted championship and a coveted prize. And, and I would like to think as a fan first and, and maybe as a, as a media member second that we will sooner rather than later get to a point where we do have uh, you know some unity and we have a situation where you've got all these guys, they're not just seeing each other, you know, four times a year. It's going to be more than that. But uh, listen, I, I gave up trying to prognosticate where this thing was going to go a long time ago. Uh, so I will, I will leave that to uh, to others that are that are maybe a little more plugged into this. But I, I do think, from a fan perspective, the product overall is going to get better. Uh, it's going to be more enjoyable the more we can get these guys together uh, on a regular basis. Yeah, it's a wide move, wise move not trying to predict it because I've tried once or twice and it's gone horribly wrong on file. So uh yes, no one no at, one has gotten a prediction right so far. I don't care no, what no, part no. of this you, you've tried to take a stab at. No one's no one's got it. I hope it happens though. You know, I think this week it'll be interesting because you know, even a fantastic tournament that we were at, like the players, I'm like, they couldn't this couldn't have gone better for them. The ratings are still down like 20%. It'll be interesting for me to see what the ratings come in at for the masters. Um, if those are at the baseline, what they're usual or better than that, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing for the PGA tour necessarily. It could be viewed as like, okay, we have a problem. Like this is showcasing that the thirst and people wanting to watch professional golf are still there, but they're not coming to our product on a weekly basis. So it, it could kind of go both ways before we touch a little bit more on the actual golf course setup this week. I wanted to ask you, you know, it's the, it's the biggest week of the year, I think for historical trends and looking at, you know, what has happened historically at this course and players that fit into certain boxes and you got to have a top 20 in the last eight weeks. You can't be a debutante, all this stuff. Do you buy into the narratives like that when it comes to golf betting, or do you think most of them are just sort of happenstance and overvalued in a sense? Uh, I think that I buy into it more this week than most weeks because it's such a, a situation where you know, you're coming back to the same course year after year. You build upon these trends, and, and I think it's something where it, it, it kind of gets in the players' heads, right? They know everyone that's a first-timer is walking into this knowing that no one has won it since Fuzzy in 1979. And everyone mm -hmm. knows about, oh, you can't miss the cut before last week, and you have to have you know these sort of stroke gain metrics in the last four or five starts. It's not it's not new to the players, and, and I think that it's something where the course is just so predictive in terms of what you need to succeed and what will get you in trouble if you stray uh, that it does kind of – it's a little bit more predictive for me and, and something I'll, I'll give a little bit more stock to. I will say my uh, colleague Ben Everill uh, wrote today on Golf Bet. He did a whole eliminator, like taking 89 to 1 to find the winner, which he did. Shout out to Ben. He did find Ron last year with this column. But it's, it's using those sort of stats. It's not only – Stuff like, oh, you know, rookies can't win, but it's you need to hit 68% of your greens and regulation for the season because you have to be so precise with your GIRs at, at this event and things like that. So uh, I, I do think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested to get your thoughts on it as well, but I think of all the weeks of all the courses, this is the one where I'm going to put the most stock into those sort of trends and historical recipes, essentially, to try and point to winners. Yeah, I think for most of them, when I look at them on the whole, I'm like, this this doesn't hold up on a typical PGA Tour week, but I'm with you. The trends pieces that come out every year almost always nail it. Like, it's if the guy doesn't win, he's in the top five that it breaks it down to. So they do a very good job. This course is extremely repeatable. It rewards experience and history and knowledge more than any on tour. Um, just kind of getting into some of my course notes, which I'll give here, and by by all means, we'll add anything that you have here. But um, obviously, Augusta National Golf Club. We are not more intimately familiar with any golf course probably on the planet. 1933, Alex, Alistair McKenzie and Bobby Jones design. Um, like I mentioned earlier, they've done an amazing job of just keeping up with the modern player while holding the essence of the golf course that it is. Um, it rewards patience, but it also rewards aggression. And I think being able to dissect when to be aggressive and when to be patient is what ultimately correlates to success more than anything else here. Um, the course's heart and soul is in the green complexes. They, when you look at the contours and the topography, they remind me of like 
ocean floors, how they just kind of wave in random directions. Um, they're extremely fast. There was a great piece by um, Ken from golf.com that had this sort of the uphill downhill look. And, and that's every hole here. That's not unique to one hole. That's every hole location. Some of them will reward a draw. Some of them will reward a fade. Uh, it just it, it's it's even right. I don't think that there's any particular skill set that is overly advantaged in terms of shot shape. It's a second shot golf course. It's all about unlocking Augusta is unlocking the par fives. That's where you're going to do 70 percent of your scoring historically here. Um, 73 percent of approach shots come from north of 150 yards. If you can hit a five iron or a six iron really well, you're going to play really well at Augusta National. You mentioned Greens and regulation rate are always extremely corollary to success. First time all year we've had bent grass greens and this type of speed and this type of elevation. There's really not a course on the PGA Tour that is like a great prep for Augusta at this schedule because you've got T, you've got holes like number 10 where you have 120 feet elevation change from T to green. You've got these bent grass greens that we have not seen once on the schedule this entire season. The fairways are rye and died and, and they've got that color that we're so used to um it's just an amazing spectacle of a golf course that i think we'll all cherish there's a million course previews out there that will break it down in greater detail that i have but those are just some of the notes for myself to sprinkle in do you have anything to add there little things about augusta national you see that could help yeah it's a one of one i mean there, there's nothing like it you know Ooh. certainly anyone that's been there can tell you that the the undulations are no joke and they're probably more you know, stated than, than you can try and explain to someone that hasn't been there. There's not a flat lie on the entire golf course. And and I, I think that's part of the beauty of it, as you pointed out. Some holes are going to need a draw, some are going to need a fade. Uh, it, it, you definitely need the mixed bag. I thought there was interesting insight from Rory last week at Valero when he looked at it and said, listen, if you go to Augusta National and just try and shoot a 72 and take your foot off the brakes, like you can probably shoot 68, 69. You're not worried about it. As you said, you, maybe you make a birdie or two in the par fives, you kind of keep the ball in play, but it's when you go out trying to shoot a number, you go and say, I need to shoot a 67 today. That's when you bring 75 into play. It's it's definitely one of those counterintuitive courses. Uh, you know, the, the the media members that play on, on the Monday after, you, you move up a, a set of tees and all of a sudden you can shoot, you know, in the high 70s, or low 80s, depending on, on your, your game or scratch play or even better because you're right, it's, it's a second shot course. There's no rough. It's pretty wide open off the tee and you put it in the right spot. And now all of a sudden you can hit 10, 11, 12 greens in regulation as a as a hack uh, player, so to speak. Uh, but then it's it's when you really try and dial it in and you try and put a score on on this on the card that that's when things can get interesting. All right, let's look at some guys on the board. Top of the board this week and reigning universal number one world champion of professional golf is Scotty Scheffler at four and a half to one. Do you, you get into WrestleMania, Will? I do not get into WrestleMania. Uh, I, I dabbled a bit in my younger years, but I, I at least All picked right. up enough to get the reference. So I'm good with it. We can, we can, me, me, me and my son got into it last night. Yeah. It was a good show. Um, all right. <laughs> Rory McIlroy, number two on the board there. Then you have John Rahm at 12 to one Xander Shoffley number, uh, pretty steadily creeping downward as the day went on today um 14 to 1 in some spots 16 to 1 it looks like still available at DraftKings right now brooks kepka number moving the opposite direction 18 to 1 16 to 1s all last week we're now seeing 22s hideki at 22 spieth at 22 those are your players under 31 i want to start with scotty um making its way around the bird app this evening as i got home from my son's practice was a quote by uh brandle that said you could see scotty winning by eight to ten shots if he just putts well this week is he in this neck like is there any players that you are currently willing to put in his tier like not not if he plays well like that's okay. the thing i saw a tweet i think it was from Matt gannon tonight where he was like i, I just want to tell my non-golf friends that are swooping in for the masters like just just take scotty at 400 or 450 because at least you're going to have a sunday sweat you're going to have something uh on the line so maybe maybe we overthink this to where we try and find reasons not to take this prohibitive favorite at this ultra short price it's the shortest masters favorite since tiger in 2013 he's the shortest fight price for any major since jordan spieth has gone for three in a row at st andrews back in 2015 so we're in uncharted territory at least when it comes to the last seven eight nine years in the world of golf 
but it's deserved, it, right? He, he went win, win second. And even before that, he was, you know, essentially sniffing around everything in the top five and top 10 range uh, last year. So I, I, listen, Scheffler's baseline for what do you have to do to win is pretty low, right? You don't need, you don't need a ton off of his standard game. It is going to be ultimately pretty reliant on the putter as it has been for him for the last 18 or 24 months. Uh, just absolute generational ball striker. Uh, so yeah, maybe we're trying to get too creative in, in talking ourselves into, well, what could happen here? Maybe we take someone else in the 20, 30 to one range. Maybe the answer is just Scheffler. I don't know. And and he could win by eight, I guess. Uh, you know, Brandel has been known to say a, a thing or two before, uh, you know, as we've gone back a few years and, and trading barbs in the, the old golf channel newsroom. But I, I think that it's something where, yeah, he does not need to do anything extraordinary. Right. So many of these guys, once you get past about the top seven or eight on the list, you're talking to yourself into, well, this has to go right. And this has to, you know, he has to buck this trend. Colin Morikawa hasn't been hitting it like his usual self for like the last six months. So if he all of a sudden wakes up on Thursday morning and feels like Colin Morikawa of 2021, now I'm in on Colin Morikawa. You don't have any of those asterisks when it comes to what Sheffler needs or what you're expecting out of him. You're right. The floor is unbelievably high. I wrote a piece um, Sunday night. So yesterday night where um, I kind of detailed like top 10 players to watch basically. And and I got really deep into some stats. For, I tried to pick out a few things that cater to each player and give some reasoning as to why I think this player as the eighth is number eight and number seven. And you get to number one and it's like, what do you want? Everything I point to is going to tell you this guy is the best. It was like the easiest paragraph I've ever written. And I'm like, it's just, it's Scotty. It's just him. Like I, there, you can look at a million different data points. You can analyze it from all these different angles and he's the best player in the world. The interesting part is right behind him because I think I know where I stand on Rory and I, and I, and you can by all means tell me I'm wrong. I don't think he is a good bet at 10 to 1. I think Rom may be closer to Scotty than we're giving him credit for. And we just out of sight, out of mind. We might be sleeping on him a little bit this week. He's defending champion, obviously. Um, over the last five years, I had that he has gained 47 strokes on the field at Augusta National. That is the best of any player in the field. By a wide margin, by 12 strokes, he's been the best player at Augusta National. Um, he's been the best scrambler at Augusta National. It doesn't feel maybe from the outside looking in that he's playing very well on live, yet he leads that tour in birdies. He's second in greens in regulation. Um, he loves this course, and I feel kind of like he's a guy that I want a little bit with something to prove and his back against the wall. And he's stepping back into the room, hosting the champions dinner with a lot of his old colleagues that um, are going to feel a certain type of way probably about him. And I think that that is a negative for most people. I think it can be a huge positive. I think he's as motivated as anyone in the field. And if you're going to give me him at three X, the price, I, I that's kind of where I think I want my money. It's hard to envision a world where we're sleeping on the defending champ, but I, I totally agree with you know the lines of reasoning that you're you're trotting out there. I think one one point on Scheffler just to go back to that is you think back to 2022 and he was playing so well coming into that he had just won the match play and there were all these trends about like well you can't win your start before and then win the Masters you can't be world number one and win the Masters and he he blew it all up and and he won the tournament and now he's materially better than he was in 2022 entering the masters yes. every facet of his game is is raised so that's certainly a warning shot for uh, everyone not named scotty scheffler trying to win the masters this week uh but you're right listen you know rom it's it's remains to be seen how he's going to come out of the gates and he's going to deal with the, the pageantry of the champions dinner tomorrow night it'll be uh, i'm sure it'll be a good a good meal based on the menu that he's got with with jose andres but uh rory rory is interesting because it's it's hard to kind of get behind him from an outright market perspective at such a short price, given the, the scar tissue and the, the cobwebs and trauma that waits around every corner for him here. And uh, it, it's something where you look at his resume and it's littered with top tens and T5, T7, and, and you feel like he's been in it every single time, but really having been through those, uh, it's not quite right. played out that way. I will say the one stat that I look at with Rory that gives me pause for concern is if you look at in his master's history, the, average of his highest round for the week 
is 75.4 cents. Every year he puts up a clunker. Like, and we're not talking to 70, you know, only one year has he had all four rounds of par or better. But for the most part, if he goes off the rails, he goes off the rails in a big way to get to 76, 77, put up an 80 one year. And so that's going to be the key for me. It's not how low can you go on the good days. It's how low can you keep the bad day that inevitably comes around at Augusta National at this tournament. So how do you turn a 75 into a 72 or a 71 and keep yourself in the mix? Because I know that Rory is going to go out and put up birdies. You know, you and I were out there at, at Sawgrass. He yeah. led the field in birdies for the week. He was setting records. But he couldn't keep the bogeys and doubles off the card. It's the same recipe this week for the Masters. If he wants to get into that long-awaited and, and sought-after green jacket, it's about eliminating the squares, not about adding the circle. Yeah, so Sawgrass was interesting because I, I – I bet Rory that week under the premise that I thought that he had his putter figured out at the Arnold Palmer when he met with Brad Faxon. And I said, if he can just hit a wedge, he's going to play really well. Um, first round lead in. And I think we even spoke after the round when the, he got into the thing with Spieth. And, and I, you know, I, I was one of the only people that took Rory that week. And I'm like, I would feel good about it. But the problem to me with Rory is I know that I feel like he's a sponge and he's going to absorb all of this negativity in the media in online that is, you know, filtering to this situation with Jordan Spieth. He's going to absorb it all and it's not going to help him and it's not going to play out well. And that's exactly what took place. I think that he's like that a little bit with Augusta national where he has absorbed all this negativity and these bad energy over the years that he has these demons with the place, but I will say, interestingly, in the full swing, Doc, I saw that you know, he was frustrated. I think it was after the U.S. Open, or maybe it was the PGA Championship, where he was sitting in the locker room beside himself after like a seventh-place finish, and he was like, I think it's time for me to blow it all up and start fresh. Um, you could take that a number of different ways, but he has kind of done that this year. He's been working with Butch. He really... Um, totally re-engineered his schedule. He played three times in Florida, which was atypical when he decided to play in the Cognizant Classic. He's now playing the week before the Masters instead of his normal, you know, 100 practice rounds that he got in last year or whatever it was. So I, I can appreciate that he's trying something different to change the energy. And we'll see if that pays off for him this week. Um, I think Rom is my favorite bet from the top. You know, Xander's another guy at the players, Will, who... Um, being there and standing in front of him as he answered questions after a couple of those days, I was kind of blown away by his presence and his ability to appear to be in a very good place mentally despite something very bad happening to him. And you would think that he's the type of guy with this burden of he hasn't won in so long and he's carrying this heavy weight on his shoulders. But he seems very much at peace with himself. He was kind of laughing it off. And he's like, they were asking him a question about the live merger and the meeting in the Bahamas. He's like, I don't care about any of this. Like, I, I just, uh, you know, he's he's kind of seems like he's tuned everything out and seems in a very good place mentally and playing very consistently. Um, do you think that this is a deserving price at 16 to one when you have a former champion in Hideki and fantastic form there at six points more, um, a major Goliath in Brooks Kepka sitting right there and Jordan Spieth at Augusta. It feels like a, I want to get in on Xander here because I like his chances, but I can't at this price. Are you there with me or do you kind of, are you feeling Xander this week? Uh, it is. I think he's on the short list. I, I think you're right in terms of the market analysis of it's hard to take Xander at 16 and maybe not some of those other guys at 22 or even higher uh, because they, they have been there before, you know, with, with Speed and Matsuyama, they've won here before. You think back to 21 when Xander was right there with the decky down the stretch before that water ball right. on 16, uh, you know, he was in the mix in 2019. He can win uh, at this tournament and no one's going to be surprised to see him get in the jacket on, on Sunday afternoon. But uh, it's interesting for Xander, as you said, There, there's something about him where he's able to be open and candid about like, yes, this loss pissed me off and I was frustrated about this and then still hit the reset button and go out and it, it doesn't linger with him and it's not baggage. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that everyone is surprised to see him go nearly two years now uh, without a win and especially given the close calls that he's had, including it at Sawgrass. But 
it's it's an interesting, you know, it's not quite the B squad there below those first three names, but it's let's say it's the A minus, and you can make cases for or against all of them. And I think that, you know, I I I came in very very bullish on Hideki, and I'm concerned that Hideki is becoming like a hipster pick, where mm-hmm. everyone is coming in on Hideki and be like, oh, this is a, a a former champion who's rounding into form and has all the stats and all the recent history. Well, let's pile in on Hideki at a price that's six x what Scotty is, as opposed to even three x with Rom. So uh, that's that's a little bit of a red flag for me. And then Speed, you you have to buy into the Augusta pixie dust almost, right? Like yes, he yeah. played he played well last week when he wasn't on the roof at Valero, but it's it's almost like you're just you're, I am ignoring all recent form and I'm just going with that he's going to step on the grounds there tomorrow and, and go eat John Rahm's uh, dinner. And then all of a sudden the world changes, which to be fair, we have seen happen on multiple occasions with Jordan Speed. He's been, he's been playing a lot worse than he is right now and come into the Masters and nearly won this thing. So uh, he's he's done this before. This is not like you're really trying to have this fantastical illusion of what might be. So whenever you're looking at, you know, at those names in that four pack, let's say that gets you down to the top seven, there's definitely some compelling reasons, and I don't think anyone would be surprised to see those guys either getting off to a fast start, leading after Thursday, or being in the mix come Sunday afternoon. You know, somebody asked me about him earlier today, and I'm like, nothing that I've looked at statistically would tell me that he's trending in a good direction, but I just know he's going to find a way, and he just happens to set foot um, in Augusta, Georgia, and find a way to score around this course and turn – easy holes into hard holes and hard holes into easy holes and do his thing that Jordan speed does. But you know, another one that you, I don't know about this one. So I've always been very bullish on Brooks. I've been there. You know, you see the banner on the back of my Twitter thing. You're going to see a lot of major championship trophies and uh, with Brooks kept gone them because I always pick him. I don't know this week. And I think the prevailing narrative is like speed. It's a major He'll find a way. He's going to flip the switch. He's going to turn it on. He's going to turn everything from a preparation standpoint up a notch. And he's going to mentally cripple the majority of the field and his opponents and find himself in the top five on Sunday. I don't know. I don't know if I really am buying into that this year. And this is my guy. And, you know, I I thought that um, there were some troubling aspects of Liv Doral. I think that he hasn't played great all season. Um, I don't love that, you know, he won six majors with that blade of a putter where he'd give it the little wipe and stripe in 15 footers. That seems like with ease um, switching to I, I just have a lot of concerns. Should I at 22 to 24 to one? I'm going to feel stupid when he's in the final pairing on Sunday more than any other player on the board. And do we just need to gravitate toward major championship Brooks Kepka, or is it about something more at this point? Uh, I think it's hard to tell. I mean, his, his uh, yeah. stats in the majors speak for themselves, right? Like this is a guy that if you've been fading him in majors over the last seven or eight years, you're in the poorhouse as a result. I mean, he just comes around and, and as you said, finds a way, but it is hard you know, going into this week with knowing what we know to figure out where his game is at and how it's going to respond to the pressures of this tournament. And even, you know, getting into a situation, whether it's like he was last year, where it seemed like he was going to win that tournament for a long time uh, before John Rom kind of chased him down and Brooks shoots 75 in the final round to to come in uh, a little bit short behind Rom. So, listen, the, the talent is certainly there. The major pedigree is there. He goes around the next month and wins the PGA Championship and no one was – exactly surprised but there is also the other the other part of it is that well you can't just you're not just gonna blind bet him for you know every major there, there needs to be something where you can look at and see all right maybe this is some this is a reason to buy in beyond just brooks kept in a major the next range is is so intriguing to me um they're right outside of that sort of tier b on the odds board but there are a lot of storylines with a lot of different players. Joaquin Neiman is playing fantastic at 30 to one. You have the young stud in, in Ludwig at 30 to one, but he's a debutante. You have two top five players in the world three months ago in Victor Hovland and Patrick Cantlay drifting big time to 35 to one. I did not envision us in January. I didn't envision us coming into the masters and having Xander at 16 to one Victor and Cantlay at 35 and none of them have won. 
Um, they've drifted. Will Zalatoris, I mentioned earlier that Rom has had the best strokes gain numbers at Augusta National over the last five years. That's because Will Zalatoris has only played it twice and then withdrew. Um, he's doing it the most on a per round standpoint. Bryson, I don't know what to do with Bryson. I worry the, the hills. DJ, I kind of really sneaky like DJ this week. Um, he won Live Las Vegas. I've talked to some people in his camp that say he's he's sort of rededicated himself from a preparation standpoint to making another run at major championships. He is an anomaly because if you rule out the open championship last year, which he played terrible at um, the four majors before that, he shot 15 under par on Thursday and Friday, about as good as any player in those four majors and was 17 over on the weekend. So something just went wrong on the weekends where he was putting himself in the top 10 in every one of those majors entering the weekend Something went horribly wrong. Just JT's up there with a new caddy at 40. Tony Finau's play. There's so many guys here. Cameron Smith dueled with Scotty a few years ago coming off a withdrawal in Doral. Um, anyone here just in this encompassing range of 30 to 50 to 1, Will, that you kind of have your eye on and penciled in that, that you're going to look to next week? Yeah, I think you've, you've run through uh, a bunch of the reasons that, that some of these guys stand out. I, I'm with you. I'm enamored with the drift on, on Cantlay and Hovland. I'm not looking to buy either one, but I think it's fascinating just recency yeah. bias when it goes the other way of these guys disappear for the wrong 6, 8, 12-week span, and now it's all of a sudden the scrubs again. And, you know, we're, we're six months removed from Victor Hovland being the hottest name in golf or whatever. Uh, the, the one of this group that I am probably the most bullish on is Ludwig. And, and I think that... <laughs> This is, it, it's such an amazing needle that he is threading to have won on the PGA Tour, won on the DP World Tour, won the Ryder Cup, and never played in any major. Not only the Masters, he's never played a major. And that is a, that is like the reddest of red flags I could possibly throw out there. And somehow I'm still talking myself into trying to, to have some action on him, uh, whether it's a finished market or maybe even the outright, just because he, he has the sort of game that really should translate well this week. And he's coming off a week at the Valero where he led the field and strokes game tee to green. Like that's kind of what you want. And, and now, yes, there's all, there's the narrative that you have to figure out the greens and it takes some experience, but we've also seen what Jordan Spieth did in his rookie uh, season at the masters. Jonas Blix, as my former colleague, Josh Cole pointed out today, if Jonas Blix can finish T2 in his master's debut, it's not exactly impossible. So uh, Ludwig is someone that I'm, I'm interested to, to continue to look at for potentially derivative markets. I think it's a, a fascinating race between him and Wyndham Clark in the debutante uh, markets. I, I've seen Ludwig as a slight favorite, like around plus 300. Maybe Wyndham is plus 333. Uh, again, another situation where this guy has won three times last year's Masters. He was not even on the radar. No one was talking about at last year's Masters. Oh, what? It, it's, it's, you know, we don't have Wyndham Clark here, so it's not, it doesn't feel quite the same. He was just an afterthought until he won it at Wells Fargo and translated that into his, his breakthrough at LACC. So uh, another guy that I'm interested to see, I, I remain out, I, I think, on JT when it comes to the Masters, even before the bone stuff. I, I feel like this probably won't help things as he tries to adjust. I, I don't really know. It's hard to gauge the vibe off of his social media posts and uh, figure out exactly how that went down and, and what it means for him moving forward. Certainly the timing can't be ideal. I now see it the week before. Uh, you know, the first major of the year. But uh, of these, of this group, I'm looking at the the two debutants, particularly Ludwig. And honestly, the other guy uh, that pops to me is Tony Finau. Uh, that's going back to your Kepka talk of when that's a guy that you could see in the top, in the last three tee times on Saturday or Sunday. And you think to yourself, how was he 40 to one? Almost shades of where Hideki was in 21. Like he's, he's in the mix. He's someone that you feel like could win a major, but he, ha he hasn't really clicked at all this year he showed a little bit of signs of life in defending his title at houston two weeks ago maybe that's enough uh to, to flip the switch but this is a course where he has played well before he was in the final group of tiger back five years ago every everything about his game aligns with what you need at augusta national it's just it hasn't been there yet this year and i think that's why the price is where it is yeah you made some fantastic points i can't believe i just brushed right over wyndham clark there too it's funny because <laughs> you know we talk about like it's it's so interesting with golf how one little moment in something that could per be perceived as in a way a lucky break can completely alter the course of the betting odds a few weeks later like 
when I think about Patrick Cantlay, you know, we're giving Hideki so much love, but Hideki shot the course record at Riv and Cantlay, if Cantlay can just close that thing down on Sunday and we avoid a course record from Hideki Matsuyama, Cantlay is probably 16, 18 to one this yeah. week. If Wyndham, if Scotty Scheffler doesn't hole out for Eagle on the final Sunday at the Players Championship, maybe Wyndham gets in that playoff. Maybe he wins the players. If that putt happens to drop and does it hard lip out of the hole, like there's so many ways. Maybe they need to be maybe they need to have a solar eclipse on Sunday at the players, and that would have been enough to alter the gravity just enough to get that ball to go in. That's a great point. We were that's the only thing we were missing was the eclipse. But a, a simple moment like that, and this guy's all of a sudden 20 to 1. So I think there's a ton of value in this range. Um, I'll sort of have my full card out later this week. As I move on, the few it, it starts to really narrow beyond 50 to 1 on guys in the outright market that you think have a legitimate chance to put on a green jacket. Is there one? I'll call these guys like anyone above 50 to 1 long shots. Um did you think can pull this thing off? Like, do you think a guy like Patrick Reed can do it again? Do you like Akshay coming off a win? Adam Scott's done it before. Corey Connors has played well here. These are the some of the names just beyond like 70 to one this week. Is there one in particular that you like, Will? Uh, I think the name that you, you scroll to at the top here is one that I, I have on my short list of Russell Henley. Oh, don't scroll too far. There you go. Right there. There he is. Now he's okay. at the bottom. Uh, I, I think Henley coming off the T4 last year has a lot of intrigue. Uh, and is someone who has played well here and has that skill set where he can go kind of red hot on the greens um, at the bent grass, as you mentioned, that that he kind of knows this place. I think Sahith Tagala is a very intriguing pick there in that plus 5,000 range of a player that, you know, came out and played so well last year uh, in, in his in his debut. And then now has come around. He's a PGA Tour winner. And there's a lot to like there. Um, so those are. Those are two that I, I think could be good. And then again, I'm on a, I'm on a UGA track, I guess, as a, as a Florida Gator. I think Chris Kirk is an interesting flyer. Maybe not for an outright, but if you go into the top 10, top 20 place market, I think that there's you know something we said for for Chris as someone who's just in the midst of a, of a mid or late career renaissance and has, has played solidly here before, you know, T20, T23, T33, where he's not someone that jumps off the page. But there's honestly, there's a lot of course comps. Uh, in my mind, between Kapalua and Augusta National, whether it's the elevation or the side hill lies, it, there you know, Augusta yeah. is a unicorn, but there is a little bit of what you see out in Maui. You're also going to see in Georgia. There is, and I think uh, the year last year, Rom won them both, right? I mean, it's yep. Rom, so he can win anywhere. But yeah, yeah. Um, one question, real quick, from the chat about Brian Harmon, another guy that we mentioned that was right there at the players. If you could, gosh, if you could only birdie sixteen, um, he was right <laughs> there in the mix. Um, obviously the most recent major champion now checking in 75 to one this week. You think he has a decent chance being a lefty or is this course maybe a little too long for Brian Harmon? Harmon was on my uh, short list. He was my long shot pick at the players. So I'm still, the wound hasn't healed uh, fully. Everyone's worried about, uh, yeah, Wyndham Clark's put on 18. I'm still going back to the tee shot on 16 for Harmon. Like, Man, what, I know. what might've been uh, the thing, the thing with Harmon for me is he has really not played well at Augusta. And, and there are times where you see guys, maybe turn a, a mediocre master's uh, record and, and then find a way to get through. But it's very rare. I, I feel like I haven't I haven't gotten every player's bio here. But to, to think of someone like Harmon who has missed three or five cuts at the Masters, he's only finished once inside the top 40. It's generally a place. It's funny. We've seen so many lefties do well here. And Harmon, it really hasn't clicked. So I feel like he's got enough of a course history in a negative fashion to make me kind of pause and, and look elsewhere. Because after four, five, six times around this place, I, I start to believe into the trends the other way as well. Yeah, I'm pulling up now as I switch back to my screen here because I got it before I get you out of here. I know you're, you've been very gracious with your time. Oh, we're good, man. I'm looking at here it is. OK, top 40 market, because I think this is a reasonable expectation point. Tiger Woods, I have to ask you, Will Gray, plus 120, top 40. Is that a reasonable expectation for him this week? Like, do you think he gets through four rounds? And if so, can he produce on a top 40 bet at, at plus money? Yeah, I, I think that's uh, max effort from him. I, I definitely think okay. a, a goal of his this week is going to be making the cut. He has never missed the Masters cut as a professional. If he makes the cut this week, it breaks the all-time record for consecutive made cuts. I guarantee you, as much as he's in the stats and records and, and knows those things, he's thinking about that 
this week. Uh, so I, I really think that that's going to be a big goal for him coming into the first round of, of positioning himself in a, into a place where he can potentially make the cut with uh, a good second round. I, I'll be interested to see where his tee time shake out of, does yeah. he get the early late draw to allow himself a little bit more time uh, to, to recover and, and get the body right. If he goes late early, I, I don't know. I, I, I would, you know, I think he's got a better shot if he goes early or late. Um, but then yeah. you also have to remember the cut rules, right? So we're at 89 guys. The cut's going to go to top 50 in ties. So now all of a sudden you're sitting on a top 40 ticket where conceivably you have like 54, 55 guys making the cut. And so he doesn't have to do much more beyond just make the weekend in order to catch that top 40, especially depending on your dead heat rules and all that stuff. So long story short, I think plus money on a top 40, I can definitely get behind that. But I, I really feel like that's max goal. I don't foresee a, a situation, especially with how little we've seen of Tiger this year, withdrawing it at Genesis at Riviera. There's, there's nothing really to go on to think, oh, maybe he's got lightning in a bottle. He could top 10 or something like that. I think this is really just something where he wants to be there all four days. It's meaningful for him to make the cut whenever he tees it up here. I think that's going to be the goal, stated or otherwise. And so that's where I would focus my markets. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to hear him talk tomorrow, right? Yep. Yeah, we'll hear him talk tomorrow. I'll, I'll, I'll listen to every word and hang on. Sure. I'll probably get suckered into this bet. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I was hopeful. I was really hopeful of this run from what I saw, like, in December and at the Hero. And then, obviously, the withdrawal with the illness. And then was, frankly, surprised we didn't see him in March after he said he was going to try to play every month. And he avoided that sort of situation. Um, anxious to see him sort of in his presser tomorrow. Uh, Will. Awesome talking to you about the Masters, my friend. Uh, what else do you guys over at the Golf Bet team have sort of coming out this week? Um, anything else sort of from a content perspective that, that some people watching this show may be able to check out more? Oh, we've got we've got plenty of content. Come come check us out here. We've got a lot, whether it's, uh, you know, articles, as I said, Ben herbal has got a, his Eliminator 89-1 to, to, to crown a champion. We're going to have some stuff looking at uh, Scotty Scheffler and, and just how odds makers were able to tap into to different odds makers point of views and how they're handling the avalanche of Scheffler money because remember these markets have been up for a year so it's not like the usual PGA Tour event where you post them on Monday and then you take the action until Thursday these books are, are sitting on a lot of Scheffler tickets as he's gone from 850 or 900 all the way down to about 400 as a consensus favorite uh, video stuff we've got our golf at round table with our, our team of four tomorrow uh, afternoon that'll stream live on our on our Twitter and we'll have it on our site. So plenty of stuff in between looking at all the props and, and different markets that pop up for the casual fans that maybe you're swooping in and, and you only are are checking out the golf betting world around the majors or around the masters and you want to know what's available. We're going to have all the information in terms of the markets that are there, insight into who to look for and, and everything in between. You build a fantastic team over there. I've had a lot of respect for you and, and the work that you've done for a long time. It's been an honor to have you on the show. Uh, there's no better person that the tour can have sort of leading this movement for them than I think Will Gray. So I appreciate your time tonight, Will. I wish you all the best. Enjoy Masters Week. Uh, we'll get you back on soon. We'll talk to you later, my friend. Yeah, I appreciate it, Joe. appreciate the kind words. We'll have to get you back on Roundtable, too. We'll keep doing this home and away series. That'll be fine. Maybe we'll meet in Orlando and have a have a neutral site game at some point uh, with you down south and us up north. But it's it's been great to to connect with you and great to to see you a couple weeks ago at Sawgrass. Continued success. And uh, it's it's a great week. Listen, the Masters is a chance for us to kind of sit back and, and just celebrate the sport and celebrate how fun it is to, you know, go back on the year in and year out memories of just being a, a fan and watching this tournament unfold on the same familiar layout it's it's nostalgic it's awesome as you said whenever the, those piano keys start tickling it sends you right back to where you were when you were first watching the masters as a kid and and i can't wait for it and i can't wait for next year after that it's the best man i'm giddy um it was it was awesome to be a part of the round table a few weeks ago whenever you need me a phone call away great to have you on the show will gray we'll talk soon man sounds good all right, gang, uh, been working on that one for a while, so it was super pumped to have Will. Um, final thoughts before we get out of here. Thank you for checking out the show. Um, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Preferred Lines. That would be a huge thing that you could do to support me. Um, the T-shirts are out now, PreferredLinesGolf.com. Anyone who has ordered one before the Masters, it is my understanding that those have been shipped. They will be delivered. And I promise you, you're going to get that before this week. If you do not, um, send me a DM. I'll, I'll roll some heads over there. Uh, listen, guys, final thoughts. So I had a, 
you know, interesting. I, I just want to touch briefly, and this is kind of not golf related, but I had a phone call this golf, we'll call it the golf off season. So after the tour championship, and as you know, I've kind of um, ran with this a brand sort of on my own with preferred lines and really tried to make it work as a one man team. I produce the show. I write, I do the graphics. Um, I do all the, I, yeah, I, it's a one man show around here. Um, I've worked really hard at that. And I wanted to talk to someone else who was kind of in my boat. Cause a lot of other people had sort of been on teams. This was before I joined up with Rotoballer. And I called a friend of mine who had also worked on sort of building his YouTube and content platform uh, by himself. And we had probably a 45 minute to an hour talk that I found highly valuable. It was just great. It was just great to talk to someone in the same position as me working toward the same goals when you don't have people around you to bounce business ideas off of in terms of growth. Um, it was great to talk to him. I'm talking about my guy, James, um, DGen75. Uh, if you followed his tweets recently, um, he was able to join a team as well, and I was super fired up for him. I joined Rotoballer. He joined the team over at Ship It Nation, um, was super thrilled for his you know, activity over there and being able to find a group of like-minded people to sort of grow his profile, to grow his ideas, but also keep his brand that he had worked so hard for intact and not sell that out. Um, James is going through some health problems right now. He tweeted out earlier today, he was doing his master's research with his first 11 hour chemo treatment. Um, I think that we're around the same age. Um, I didn't want to tweet anything about it. I, I sent him a long text a few days ago. Um, anyone in the space, this is a good person. We need to lift each other up in these sort of experiences. He's not asking for anything. He doesn't want your money thoughts and prayers. Think of people like this and think about your own life. And this is someone the same age as me who was very much in a similar position six months ago, who has now had this turn in life. And it, and it helps me to put some perspective on things going well in these times and to appreciate it with all the madness going around with two kids under the age of seven, um, with me running home from a day job to go to my son's practice to coach and team pictures and getting back 10 minutes before this show went live and trying to do my prep. And we're juggling so much to take a few minutes out of your day to realize that um, there are other people who's not as lucky as you and to appreciate what you have, but also put some perspective and some thought and a few prayers into those people who really need them around you, especially in times like this. We wish you all the best, big guy. We're thinking about you over here. Thank you guys all for checking out Preferred Lines. It's been an honor to bring you this show this entire season. Thank you for coming on this journey with me. Uh, we'll talk soon. Have a great week. Enjoy the Masters. It is the best week in all of golf. I hope that you hit a winner. We'll talk soon. I'm out of here. My name is Joe Idoni. This has been the Preferred Lines Podcast. Peace. Mm -hmm.